welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Joe Moore here with Kyle Buller for Solidarity Friday episode. Uh, this comes out December 3. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing well, Joe. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Beautiful. Uh, what is it, Wednesday? We're recording. It's Wednesday, yeah. Yeah, nearly 50 degrees in Breckenridge, which is uh, probably the warmest it's going to be here for a while. That's so warmer stoked. than it is here right now. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so um, before we get in, uh, this is going to be an interesting two-part episode. Um, we have an interview from the CEO of MindCure, Kelsey Ramsden, and um, we are in a business relationship with them, so keep that in mind as you listen. Uh, but it is a, a really cool concept. Um, it's, a, it's about time we start looking at other indications, and that's kind of what they're getting into. Um, so I'll let you check that out on your own, make your own judgments, and have fun with it. Um, yeah, January 6th, we kick off Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists. Kyle, what can you tell us about that class? Yeah, so uh, January 6th, we'll do, uh, if you guys have been listening, um, it's a hybrid kind of course, um, a lot of online pre-recorded material, uh, and then you'll join us for the live classes for an hour and a half, so get to hang out with us, and um, we'll do some presentation, open it up for Q&A, and really kind of do a deep dive um, into the topic, so you, we can get into all the little nuances. Um, we have tons and tons of uh, great interviews and lectures <laughs> within the course, so you'll get lifetime access access to all the pre-recorded material, and then you'll also get any access to the uh, live classes as well. Um, so yeah, join us. It's, it's fun. It's nine weeks. Um, we added an extra week in this round. Um, we have two groups. One's at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and the other one is at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And again, so that uh, we have an hour and a half class. So, And then there's also a fun little integration project for our last class, everybody engages in their own process and kind of shares a project at the end, which is always really, really fun. Um, always really cool to see what students come up with. Yeah, yeah, cool. So um, yeah, learn more Psychedelics Today and um, we'd love to have you. It's such a fun class. Um, one of the best things I've done as part of this project is definitely teaching those courses. All right, so... Um, I guess let's jump in with some highly political stuff. Um, <laughs> our <laughs> We've had uh, some hard thinking about this one. It's taken a long time to figure out what to do. Um, but we actually had to recently ban Robert Forte from the Facebook group, um, unfortunately. And, um, you know, the whole thing kicked off because he alleged, uh, had firsthand account, um, you know, without first, I don't really understand how evidence works, but he had a first hand account of conversation with Albert Hoffman, who is close personal friends with blaming nine 11 on quote unquote, the Jews. And that's how the whole conversation started. It's like, okay, that's kind of fucked up, but it's an old Swiss man who survived the war. So do we really expect better from people or, you know, but I think the underlying discussion was more like, um, do psychedelics actually help people? Um, to the degree pop culture and the narrative wants you to think it does. Like, does a 90-something-year-old man who discovered and used plenty of LSD not have anti-Semitic views and have more pro-social views? And the point is, no, not necessarily. But then Robert went further and started, you know, <laughs> went a little too far in my book, kind of linked to some Holocaust denial stuff, and it was really ugly. And it's just not a thing for our Facebook group. Um, I recorded it. I deleted the post eventually. Like I just realized Robert wasn't like a net positive, unfortunately for the group. Um, kind of just saying some wild stuff, sometimes good critiques, but yeah, it's just too far now. So he's out. Um, I'm probably going to add some comments to the blog post and the podcast, um, with him just to like indicate this. And it's unfortunate, it's sad, but you know, it's, we need to protect psychedelics today. And that kind of stuff is not great to have on our platform, not helpful. And I made a lot Honestly, of people upset in the group. Yeah. Too. Well, made a lot of people upset lot of people and it's upset. just not great. Um, you know, a lot of people said because of this kind of conversation happening on your group, I'm probably not coming back. I'm like, okay, like <laughs> got it. Um, so that's what we've chosen to do. Um, and Robert, sorry, I hope we can figure it out in the future, but you know, we're going to need some time. And, uh, 
yeah, I guess um, anything else we want to add to that? No, I think that's probably about it for that one. <clears throat> cool. Um, yeah. Next up, highly political. <laughs> so I want to be really transparent. I um, <laughs> My relationship with Symposia has not been good for a long time. I don't know if everybody knows that, but it's kind of where I'm at. Um, and I'm just reading Twitter right before we start recording, Kyle. I read a uh, statement from the famous... Uh, member of Symposia, David Nichols. He's really, uh, really lovely on social media. Um, says this, uh, the tweet is, this is a bold statement from Jomo 137 in light of the fact that he and psychedelics today promoted Borzat well after they knew about abuse allegations against her. Additionally, his let things shake out approach isn't so different from my met Australia's MMA's wait and see approach. IMO. So, um, he has screenshots to a tweet I made or Facebook post looks like, I don't know how he's getting, I blocked him ages ago. I don't know how he's getting my Facebook feed posts, by the way. Um, Lots of other but here, yeah, right. Um, apparently I need to ban a lot of people. So anyway, it says, looks like MindMed Australia thinks it's a good idea to give center for consciousness medicine, a platform in an upcoming series. Interesting decision. My move would be to wait a few months, at least for this thing to shake out. This is far too fresh. I'm sure more is coming. So Center for Consciousness Medicine isn't Francoise Borzat and Aharon Grosspart. It's a large community of a lot of people. Um, my commentary is that a lot of these people were probably complicit in hiding a lot of this craziness. Um, so is the organization as a whole going to survive or not? We don't know. <laughs> and is the organization as a whole going to be able to repair from this? We don't know. I, I personally think Francoise and Aharon need to leave the scene. 100%. I don't know enough about the group to really comment. Um, I do know there's a lot of revolutionary stuff happening inside that group, and I hope it shakes out for the best, but is it really the worst thing in the world to start a new group and just scrap what you had before? Not really. It's probably the right move. Anyway, he kind of took my comment a little bit out of context, which is kind of classic for him. And then, you know, he... We, Psychedelics Today, on September 23, posted this ad for, uh, what was the name of the conference, Kyle? It was uh, Beth Weinstein's uh, Psychedelic and Business uh, Conference. I forget the title. Psychedelics and Purpose, Psychedelics and Business. Um, yeah. And so that was right. a mistake on our end. Um, you know, that and we just screenshot... shared the copy they sent us, right? Like, we should have been a little more careful, but we weren't. Um, yeah. Yeah, I sent and, it over to our social media manager. Um, you know, I guess I didn't really look through it and just I forwarded it over. They they um, shared it. Um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't, I guess, thinking of like, oh, okay, I need to really read through this. Thinking maybe the team knows uh, everything that's going on. Sometimes not. So it was a good reminder to do some of these back end updates with our team. Um, but, you know... Before that got posted, I already had a, um, a conversation with the person um, around the whole thing that was unfolding. And this is before anything started. Saying to, things like, I'm not um, comfortable presenting with this person being on the bill, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just kind of hinting towards, you know, things are, sounds like they're in the works. Things will kind of possibly um, get exposed at some point. Um, and then a few weeks later, everything did come out with Will Hall's uh, article there. Um, so Francois was pulled from that event um, after I had that conversation. Um, so... You know, I, I don't know if the, the organizer also did their own due diligence to check in with other people to, you know, kind of back up um, to see, yeah, what, what I was saying was truthful. Um, but, you know, now it's 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 public um, since Will's story came out. So, you know, that was just a small error on our end. Um, so for David and the rest of the team suggesting that we were actively promoting that um, is kind of false. You know, it was just a mistake on our end. And we corrected you know, it just... and advocated quite a bit, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, I've personally been kind of beefing with MindMed Australia um, and made multiple comments about it. <laughs> like, we got to really watch MindMed Australia. It's a little goofy. But, you know, next up, Nichols' next post was um, a screenshot of Tanya De Jong um, and Nigel Denning over there at MindMed Australia being on a webinar with. Francoise and Bill Richard and everybody knew about all the bullshit with Francoise and 
This was after little, all that was leaked, too. Yeah, I think, this is right? just the other day almost. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I had friends reaching out to me saying, hey, I have an invite to talk here, but Francois is here. What the fuck do I do? And I'm like, well, bail. Get the hell out of there. There's no reason why you should be at a conference. So, you know, and you and I have been having discussions about this. <laughs> we'll call it the Bay Area scene. But the Bay Area scene really, you know, a huge portion of that being this whole Borzak Grossbard community and hearing horrible shit. There's so much left to tell. Um, And, you know, I don't want to really leak too much, but we've been aware of this for years now. And, you know, thankfully, Will Hall stepped up and was willing to put himself up as a target. Um, We just thought we would go bankrupt if we did, (laughs) because they can afford my better legal representation than we can by a long shot. So we decided not to do it, Uh, which is probably why, you know, Symposia had to find a major media partner in order to do their whole new project. Um, Yeah. Cover story. I just listened to that cover story. I just listened to it uh, this morning, actually their first episode. Power trip cover story, New York mag. Is that their ally there? I think so. So anyway, Um, you know, we did what we did. It was an accident. Sorry. Like, I absolutely don't want anybody to go to that scene. I've been actively working to inform people for a very long time on this. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Whatever. And once we noticed that mistake, I mean, we took it down right away. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the text, I just actually deleted some of the text just now from like super old Facebook posts, but mm. you know, those get minimal play. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you know, actively going to try to dissuade people uh anyway whatever any attention's good attention i guess especially if it's from symposia so good stuff um next unless there's more you want to chat on this one no nope, yeah. good on that one cool yeah next up um i really like this conversation around um ketamine addiction like is ketamine recognized appropriately as being addictive or like, how do we even discuss that? So this comes from a Brom, um, actually don't know his real name, Brom at empath ventures at the real Brom on Twitter. Um, Brom kind of won what podcast of the year at, uh, at microdose. Cool. And, um, the quote is the tweet is when is the psychedelic industry going to admit that ketamine can be quite addictive? I've met several people who went to ketamine doctors to treat their alcoholism and ended up just getting addicted to ketamine instead. And the amount of people I know who recreationally um, sniff ketamine in LA multiple times a week, but of course they aren't addicted. It can stop anytime they want, bro, is insane. Um, Well, yeah, there's a lot of ketamine use in the underground. Um, I've I've asked some ketamine professionals about this and the pushback I get is for lack of a better phrase, uncomfortably firm. Um, Really reminds me of some of the scenes in Hulu's Dope Sick, where Purdue Pharma absolutely refuses to acknowledge that Oxy has any risk at all. Luckily, the other psychedelics don't seem to have this issue. Is anybody else noticing this? I think I responded with this. We at Psychedelics today regularly call it the addictive psychedelic. We have hope in it, but very much understand your comments here. As many in the space don't have insight have the insight required uh, for it to be well harnessed. Yeah. I don't know. Kind of tooting our own horn, but like, I I really appreciate your frame on ketamine, Kyle. Like it can't, yeah. Just like anything, like things can get overused, Um, especially if they feel good. Like, well, I think that's kind of feel like being drunk a little bit. Right. So like, I feel like that's the danger around just the biochemical um, narrative approach to to ketamine and healing, Um, because then I feel like it gives you maybe a reason to keep going back to it. And if it does have addictive properties, then, yeah, people might get addicted to it because they feel like they need to keep going back to that type of experience to get the healing. Um, and yeah, people do get addicted, especially in the recreational setting. Right. Um, you know, I'd say hopefully within the medical setting, somebody is looking after that and possibly noticing when somebody may be overusing, you know, I guess, Hey, who's the prescriber who's, you know, over prescribing here, um, and, and whatnot. So, 
So I'm wondering if he's actually also referring to people that are using it in the medical context or just those that are doing, quote unquote, ketamine therapy in the underground in, in L.A. Right. There's not enough discussion there. Well, let's ta- no. let's talk about biomedical model. Like, what is that and how does it compare to what you think is a more appropriate model? Well, I guess when I think about that approach, I think about like some of the just IV clinics and really thinking about um, ketamine having the effect on the brain and, and the receptor sites um, to help you know treat treat depression, right? There is some sort of biological factor there um, that, that's helping to to reduce those symptoms. Um, but I think as with any sort of psychedelic that, um, you know, that's only temporary, right? I mean, we could maybe look at something like psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca, and you do, you know, you have that afterglow effect and you feel really good, right? It's tickled your uh-huh. serotonin receptors a bit and you now you're on top of the world for like a few weeks. And then you finally come crashing down, um, you know, not always, but I always think about um, Ram Dass' story when they locked themselves up in the state up in, in New York um, and they just took, you know, just thousands of micrograms of acid and the plan was to never come down. And I guess they all got sick, him and Leary and, and whatnot, and whoever else was there. Um, and I remember uh, it's the story is in Be Here Now. I'm sure many of those that have read that book might remember it. But yeah, I think the, the story ended and we finally came down. <laughs> So, you know, um, I think this is the the emphasis on how are we doing these medicines and what context are we doing it? What supports do we have? And also really focused on that integration period. Like, um, I think my goal with a lot of these medicines and approaches is to actually not having to go back uh, to the experience on a regular basis. Um, you know, I, I always come back and think, what are you looking for when you're, when you're constantly doing that? Um, to some degree, in some communities, I guess you could say, well, you're not doing enough of the work and you need to keep peeling the onion layers back, right? Um, just keep, keep doing more and more and more. Um, you know, my approach and, and my philosophy is, you know, more isn't always better. I think I even highlighted that, um, I made just a little video um, from our, our talk with Jeremy Narby, and he, he even mentioned that too, right? You have something that's so powerful like ayahuasca um, that can give you years and years of content to work on. Should you be doing that once a week, um, you know, <laughs> twice twice a week for, for months on end? Um, I, I find that, you know, yeah, you have a really good good trip, good experience, I mean, you can chew on that forever. I'm still chewing on stuff from years ago. I'm like, well, let's talk that? about your personal stuff with uh, cap right now. So you you kind of recently started doing some cap work with clients, and um, are you seeing kind of like a sweet spot for like a, a what drug augmented sessions, or are you seeing that it's kind of more individual? And can you kind of figure it out together? Yeah, for me, it feels pretty individual, um, you know, just the limited people I have. So it's not too many, um, you know, too many clients to, to really refer to. But um, yeah, I mean, everybody's responding very differently um, to some degree. So I think it is very individual. But, you know, my my narrative when I go into this is ketamine is not going to, you know, magically save your life or, or, or create change in your life. Yeah, it can save your life to some degree, right? Sometimes people feel like they're able to get out of their depression and, and, and do stuff. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of other factors at play. Um, and the drug is just an adjunct to the therapeutic process and to your life, right? Like, okay, you can get really deep insight, but you don't always people don't always end up acting on it. I know I don't sometimes, you know, insight doesn't always lead to change, right? And so we can always keep going back in, in, in. And, you know, this was me many, many years ago. Oh, if I just keep doing this, it will magically transform. (laughs) Um, And, you know, sometimes there's those weird transpersonal events that unfold and makes me scratch my head and go, okay, yeah, there's some weird shit going on there in the time wave continuum. Um, And something feels like it did get altered and something just magically clicked into place. That happens sometimes. Definitely not denying that. Um, But, you know, I think just to to push against some of that that mainstream narrative a little bit um, and just get into the more nitty gritty nuances of, of working with these medicines that... It's challenging work, right? And it takes time and things just don't happen overnight. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think 
when we focus too much on the medicine, that's where we, I feel like we get, um, you know, that's where those issues can lead to. I need to have another session. I need, I need this medicine for healing. Um, and what happens when you get caught in that cycle of needing to go back, to go back and, and back to that experience? Um, you know, I think that's where you run into issues. What happens? Yeah, somebody feels like they, they really had positive transformation with ketamine. They went to their their therapist and their doctor, um, and then they completed treatment. And then they decide to go into the underground um, because maybe they've completed their treatment and they still want to do it. Um, and you know, could could they potentially get into uh, addictive habits? Maybe. Um, and I don't know how often that actually happens, but you know, just kind of doing some hypotheticals here. Um, and I think it's really important to differentiate ketamine assisted psychotherapy from ketamine therapies. Ketamine yeah. therapies can be in place for, if we include Spravato, things like suicidality, chronic pain works really well for chronic pain, by the way. So we shouldn't get down on it. Um, yeah. One infusion every two, three weeks, like can buy people a lot of their lives back. And don't joke at that. It's like, huge. Yeah. Chronic huge. pain survivor right here. Actively have chronic pain just about every day. And it's mild compared to what some people have to get treatment for. Um, and yeah, like if your chronic pains goes away and you're a little less depressed for a couple weeks, fuck yeah, like all day long. And if, yeah, you're you know, able it's to expensive stuff, as hell. You're able to get up, move, mm -hmm. um, you know do some daily activities that you couldn't typically do. That's, that's huge for a lot of people, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, this might be a good time to bring in that vice article. So vice recently critiqued mind bloom, right? Can you, can you kind of speak about how, what mind bloom does may or may not be different from ketamine assisted psychotherapy versus ketamine therapies. It's, yeah, so it's sort of a gradient. Yeah, this is a Vice article that just got released. Uh, Shayla Love wrote it, um, and interviewing a few participants for Mind Bloom, um, and just saying, like, you know, there's a lack of support. You know, they got shipped their their ketamine. Um, they had their kind of intake session, got shipped their medicine, and then they had their guides who aren't necessarily therapists. Um, you know, some people reported that it, they just didn't feel like they they got a lot of support. Um, and really in any integration from it. Um, you know, another person stated that, you know, they totally got the wrong dose and took way too much um, and they're at home and, you know, maybe not having that, that safe support uh, setting where if you do find yourself in a really kind of like difficult psychological state or somatic state too, right? Like, ooh, I'm, I'm feeling like a lot of weird sensations in my body and, you know, that's where panic can really start to happen mm. for a lot of people. Like, ooh, I feel weird. What is this? Am I, am I okay? Um, so, you know, so, so yeah, this, this article really just kind of explored, um, what was going on, um, at mind bloom, um, over the years and really since the pandemic, I mean, um, you know, I, it got me thinking, like I did go to, to mind bloom and interview Dylan years ago, and this was when they mm -hmm. actually had the physical location, um and it seemed pretty cool um you know they had their their room they had like an integration room um but then the pandemic happened and they made this the shift um to doing at home use um and to some degree i think a lot of people started to do the at home use i remember i think we uh, have a psychiatrist Bennett, friend there a few actually psychologists and psychiatrist friends saying like we should be using it um like prophylactically for depression and suicide through this pandemic situation, um, you know, as prescribers when appropriate. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Like not a big enough supply where they can do laws in just two to three times a day, maybe once or twice a week max, like in a really acute scenario. But I don't know. How, do, how did you think about that as a shift? Um, well, I think to some degree, as I was just going to mention, like, I think Raquel Bennett, Dr. Raquel Bennett put out a statement when the pandemic hit that some people should be moving to online, especially, um, for the safety when COVID really hit, right? Like exposure. Um, and I think, I, I forget what that, that, that statement still may be up on Korea uh, Institute, but you know, um, 
you know, maybe working with clients you've already worked with, like it might be okay to do at home ketamine um, therapy with people during the pandemic. So, I mean, the pandemic really opened up a lot of doors for experimenting um, because, yeah, we're th also thinking about the safety. Is it safe to be in the room together? We're trying to limit exposure in those early days. Um, and to some degree, you know, we had to make that risk analysis and say, you know, if somebody can get ketamine at home, it's relatively safe and add those safety features in. Like in the Mind Bloom article on Vice, you know, they, they do require somebody to be home with you. Um, you know, and could that really help people that are really struggling with de depressive moods? Yeah, right. And so I think it, it, it was an interesting move for a lot of people. And I think it also kind of showed the potential here, um, you know, high, high safety profile for the medicine um, and just kind of a, a new novel approach um, to, and I think it's interesting too, to with some of the colleagues and, and people that I've chatted with over the years with more kind of like this low dose at home ketamine um, and mm -hmm. kind of doing psycholytic therapy. I think there's something there on that front. You're talking like 30 um, to hundred milligrams oral. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah just, that's interesting. Just getting into that that kind of um, loosened state to, to be able to do therapy, and mm -hmm. um, it's not too overwhelming where they're totally in their you know their inner process and, and they're starting to have more of those dissociative effects. Um, but right, and um, you know, to speak back to the addictive part, like if you're being managed well, you probably won't have issues with addiction addiction can happen anywhere with anything from from fentanyl to gambling right so like it's a whole spectrum of like options and um yes it can happen yes ketamine is cheap and available in the underground so like are we the ketamine for alcohol use disorder i think ben sessa was working on this right i think Correct me if I'm wrong, everybody, but I, I think so. It might be MDMA for alcohol use disorder. Um, yeah, he did some trials with MDMA, but I think they might be moving into ketamine at Awaken. Um, so you might not be far Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he defined it recently on Twitter as a clinical psychedelic, which I thought was fun. Um, but, you know, yeah, when used in the right context with the right kind of therapists and, you know, the right kind of support and everything in the, mi in the middle there, like there's a lot of really room for great outcomes. And yes, we're going to have bad outcomes. Bad outcomes happen everywhere from surgery to treatment of diabetes, like bad outcomes happen. So we have to be ready yeah. to accept that. So like the maps figures about how many people were scored as not having PTSD at the end, like there's still 20 plus percent of people scoring as they had PTSD. Or worse, right? Like, we don't know. Like, I've not spent enough time digging into their data to know. But this is, you know, I'm sure we see it with drugs all over the place in various treatments. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Gita Vade had a comment on just, like, you know, potential risks in this article. Mm -hmm. um, might take me a little bit to, to get up here. But, um, you know, why, why is that not getting... Um, being taken into consideration um you know they had what people's say, substance abuse records or like the uh, addicted addictive impacts of ketamine uh, not not so much addiction but you know um say somebody took their life or you know these these mm -hmm. other risk factors um let me see if i could find it really quick um and for those who don't know gita vade's like a really impressive character in um, new york city I believe yeah, kind awesome. of uh she jungian Focused, um, psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic yeah, so not, focused. Not... She's contributed to our psychedelic, psychedelic shadow side of psychedelia course and the upcoming um, ketamine Academy and trauma series. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, really serious rock star. She did a recent um, hour plus um, thing with the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, I believe, the ICANN School of Medicine. Um, a lot of people said it was great. Oh, awesome. Yeah, she's wonderful. I really like her a lot. Um, this is a long, long article, so I'm having a trouble finding it. <laughs> we can move on. If I find it, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to yeah. it. Yeah, no worries. Um, and in the few minutes we've got left, just talking about mysticism. And uh, Zeus, who's one of our writers, 
um, made a tweet. We'll, we'll link to it in the show notes here, but made a tweet saying um, something along the lines of, uh, you know, here it is. Do you guys think we should stop using the word mystical to describe the psychedelic experience? Legit. Let me know your thoughts. I'm interested in what you have to say. Um, so we got a lot of action here. Sasha Sisko contributed quite a bit. Um, Brahms says, absolutely. We should avoid the woo woo. Remember Vom Brahms with a VC. So, you know, yes, from a VC perspective, yes, we should avoid the woo woo. Um, and you know, I, I don't know. Like, I think some psychedelic, and this is in, this is actually literally what somebody said. Some psychedelic experiences are mystical, but not all psychedelic experiences um, are, and not all mystical experiences are uh, instantiated by psychedelics, right? Like breath works one way, prayer is another way. Yeah, like, there's all sorts of ways to get a mystical experience, but <sighs> mysticism is very complicated, poorly understood, and um, I, it's just endlessly complex. I, you know, I think the MEQ isn't really necessarily what we should be leaning on, but they did have a really strong correlation between ME, MEQ scores and positive results from studies. Yeah. So it's kind of like a two edged sword. I, I like the critique of uh, somebody like Rick Strassman saying like, well, my religious experiences, peak religious experiences look a lot different from these mystical peak experiences. Um, you know, you'd, you'd have to read uh, his, how is it DMT and the soul of prophecy to really get a grip on that. But it's more like, you know, certain designated individuals getting messages from God. <laughs> like that's, that's often in the, in the Judaic tradition, what that looks like. And, you know, what we're think, seeing is like melting and becoming God or, you know, things like that. Um, it's a whole measure, but I don't know. What's your kind of off the cuff response to this thing? My my initial response is more of a question of what makes mysticism or mystical experience uncomfortable for people. Like, why do we need to push against it all the time? And I think within science, we want to push against it because, you know, how do you really measure what a mystical experience is? And then I guess like, you know, Brahms comment there about the woo-woo, it's like you automatically create this negative spin, putting it into this woo-woo category when if you look at the any, you know, the, the early psychedelic research with Hopkins and stuff like that, they're looking at the mystical experience correlated to change, right? Um, and so why, why as a culture do we tend to push against any sort of religious or, or mystical type of experience? I think probably because there's a lot of religious trauma, right? And we want to stay somewhat secular within this, this uh, you know, this this tradition now that science is starting to move in to really understand it. Um, you know, we don't always want it to get it caught up with the quote unquote woo woo. Cause then it doesn't feel valid. Um, but we've also got to differentiate what, what woo, -woo is compared to what mysticism is. Mysticism right. does not necessarily, well, from a degraded point of view, the things involved in mysticism are what tarot cards, crystals, I Ching, divination, these are like techniques and methods, whatever. These are different from what mysticism is. Um, we have to really be careful students. Thankfully, I'm <laughs> just shy of being a religious studies scholar. And like mysticism can look like what the experiences and practices of, you know, some druids are, some shamans in the Amazonia basin is like, um, Russian Christians who are like doing self-flagellation and other stuff to like gain mystical experiences, Kabbalists, um, various African religious traditions, like the things that are precursors to things like voodoo, um, voodoo, hoodoo, etc. Like you are communing with spirits and having that experience of everything being one and, you know, all the classical phrases. So, is what they're saying we should kick crystals out of psychedelia? You know, I think that's part of their subtext, yeah. But I, I don't know if that's exactly what they mean. Um, I think we need to just be careful. Like, don't throw the baby out of the bath with the bathwater. I, I think yeah. the way you and I 
talk about this, Kyle, is probably the safest and most comfortable way for people to talk about this stuff and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, we're here to talk about transpersonal psychology, psychedelics, and more. So, like, we're <laughs> going to defend that. <laughs> so it's, yeah. like, explicitly accounting for woo. Um, and it, it depends on what you mean. Like, woo doesn't mean yeah. it's trash, right? No. Like, how much value did Carl Jung get from astrology, tarot, and I Ching? Fucking ton. Like, where <laughs> would... Jungian psychology be a thing without tarot astrology and the I Ching. It would look very different, yeah. I guess. Um, and perhaps wouldn't be as broad reaching, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not trying to defend it. I would love to, but that's not really what I'm up to right now. Um, but it's, you know, let's just be careful around these conversations, everybody. Uh, I think it's helpful to have these, but let's, you know, tread lightly. If you haven't had a mystical experience, maybe kind of couch that when you're having these conversations, um, like understand that you might not understand what that experience is and what it means. Um, I think, you know, my inner anarchist comes out saying like, um, mystics are inherently unrulable <laughs> and, uh, you know, death doesn't mean as much to mystics. So they're willing to take more value stances. I think that's why there's so many mystics in historical literature who are kind of martyrs, mm. right? Yeah. I'm not saying we should be <laughs> martyrs, but, uh, you know, I think there's value in that on occasion. Yeah. Yeah. And when I think about this too, I'm just like reading uh, Zeus's question here again. Um, you know, it's, it is interesting when I hear people talk about psychedelics and always wanting to talk or be oriented towards the mystical and i guess like my my stance too is yeah i think some people mentioned it and, and you mentioned it is it always mystical right is that something that we always need to point towards for these experiences and i would suggest no right i mean and it, i guess it depends how it's you always the perspective too right it's like yeah. it's a yes and no because yeah. once you become a mystic everything is kind of part of that weird jumble but you know we need to treat that thing on the biographical personal level first yeah. if we want to be making progress clinical progress yeah um similarly probably with personal development self-discovery work too yeah yeah it's um yeah spot on <laughs> comment kyle sorry i kind of hijacked it but no no, think... no it's all good um yeah but, yeah i mean it's true because I, I do find a lot of people always bringing i want to have a psychedelic experience I have a mystical experience and I always have to like pull back and be like, whoa, 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 why do you want to always get towards that? And is that the, the point? Um, you know, again, like I've definitely had a lot of weird experiences that I wouldn't call mystical. <laughs> um, and I guess to some degree, yeah, you know, I guess it might fit into the, the MEQ to, to some degree, like, oh, oneness, but that's not always mystical. Um, it can just be really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think I think there is a problem there to some time, sometimes when people are always just focused on that. Like, I need to do a psychedelic to have a mystical experience. Um, and my argument is, you know, just go really slow down and pay attention to nature. That's a fucking mystical experience if you really if you really slow down enough. That's <laughs> um, you know, just watching things yeah. unfold in front of you. I mean, it's pretty wild to realize you're here on this this rock floating through space. Um, and to me, that that keeps me you know grounded and and curious about the world. Um, you know, some of my most mystical experiences wasn't my near death experience or or psychedelics. It's just really being in the present moment and seeing everything as it is. And you don't need psychedelics mm. to do that. I think that's that was Lenny's critique too, like years ago. Um, you know, the, the point is not to need to go back to these and, and chase a certain experience. How do you see it in every moment? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ken Wilber saying something like permanent transpersonal awareness. Like that's kind of <laughs> like, okay, yeah, you've now got a stable transpersonal state. It's like not transitional anymore or temporary as it was before it's always yeah. temporary and you know i just kind of want to share a personal story from 
kind of when my undergrad was going on, I was kind of like obsessed with this idea of enlightenment, like opening up the chakra system, Kundalini experience, etc. Because I was positive that once I had that, everything else in my life was going to be solved. It was kind of like a shortcut. To, well, not shortcut. I found an intellectual runaround to like the suicide thing. Um, and it was like a spiritual intellectual solution to like my deep unsatisfaction with how my day to day was looking. Um, so I was like, you know, really obsessed with transcendence and mysticism and all this other stuff as a, a way to avoid my life. Classical, uh, spiritual bypass. Bypassing. Yeah. And, um, you know, people may wonder why I have a little bit of snark around this topic. It's because I lived it. <laughs> like I was there, I was in it. I was like, yeah, not doing very healthy stuff on the regular and also having this kind of interesting transcendent thing I was looking for that would solve everything. And yeah, that's what people yeah. are looking for is a single thing to solve their lives. And then everything's good from there. It's like, well, no. You're not going to get that. It's a matter of... And I would, I, I, yeah, I would, I would argue too that sometimes when you do get an experience like that, it makes things way more complicated. Uh, you know, I just think about something like, you know, the near-death experience, how disorienting that has been to my life. Um, and it comes up in small little ways still. Um, you know, I, I get frustrated Before with Before your accident, still. Kyle, did you have like an interest in kind of mysticism and, and psychedelics? Yeah, I st- um, I started getting into meditation. Well, I came across a book called Snowboarding to Nirvana when I was mm-hmm. 15. And that really kind of got me into, um, <clears throat> you know, we're meditation. trying to get me to read that in high school, by the way. I, I just uh, didn't. That, that, that was the book that, that really turned me on. But, you know, even as a kid, I think I was really in tune with a lot of things. Um, now, I you know, I think back at it. Um, and I definitely was really in tune with a lot of different things. My mom said, you know, I was very kind of in tune with certain things. I remember always just looking up at the stars and thinking like, you know, what else is out there and um, just contemplating pretty deeply. So yeah, you know, before that experience, I definitely was in tune with a lot of things and asking some of these questions. Um, but that experience just like amplified it to, to an extreme, um, to, to some degree. And, you know, it's a bittersweet thing. Um, you know, I, I really don't wish that type of psycho spiritual crisis upon anybody, even though it was beautiful, profound, but trying to come back to a world that just, you, you, you see something so differently. Um, and, you know, you experience this with, with psychedelics too. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing, um, you know, too unusual, but yeah, just coming back and needing to fit in a little bit. Um, it's hard. I think when you, when you see things just from a, a radically different perspective, um, I mean, that's what really kind of sent me into a, a pretty heavy existential crisis in, in my teenage years. Like just being like, what is going on here? Like, I don't know if I can contain this all by myself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. It's a level of maturity. It's like a maturity mismatch with the experience level. Um, yeah. You know, thankfully you found your way through it. Um, I think if that same thing happened to somebody in their 60s, it's going to look probably a lot worse. Much different. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, similar context and like education levels because you, yeah. you're you formed so tightly at that point. It's hard to loosen yeah. to the same degree you can when you're in your teens and 20s. Teens, yeah. 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 Anyway, I think um, that's probably good for now. I've got a a little while longer with the CEO of mind cure here. Um, Kyle, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Fun conversation. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh shit, this time we should have gone for another like two hours, but whatever. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll dive back into the topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's so much more news happening in the space. So we've got to figure that out too. So, yeah. all right. Thank you everybody for listening to this segment. Enjoy Kelsey Ramsden reminder psychedelicsday.com if you want to learn more about navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists starting up january 6 seats are limited jump on in there all right see you uh, on the other side everybody all right i'm all right, ready we're here where are we we're right at the white castle we're at the white at castle the fremont street experience yeah we are fourth street it feels right <laughs> this it is does. fascinating doesn't it feel right <laughs> i love it i love this this is uh this is funny all right so Kelsey Ramsden, yes. CEO of Mind Cure. 
True. All right. So Facts. big fan of Mind Cure. <laughs> Daniel and I started chatting months ago. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? You guys are up to all this stuff? This is amazing. I know. And I was really impressed. Thank you. And I had almost no idea there was like a big software component going in it's until fair. later. Fair. <laughs> we kind of, well, I mean, for us, I think there's kind of two things. One is we haven't been too jazz handsy about mm -hmm. the thing i think you've been really subtle compared to a lot of other folks in the industry i think yeah i mean i come from a very different industry where mm -hmm. it's just all about delivering results so you don't talk about a thing until you've done a thing <laughs> and that's not to say you know there's just different ways of doing it but that's how i came into this which is really like l let's prove it Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about it. Yeah. So our technology platform was actually the thing we led with because our drug research program was not off the ground yet. Mm -hmm. And in the early days, actually, a lot of people were like, stop talking about that tech thing. Mm -hmm. Just focus on the drugs. And now, Howdy. hey, guys, we just got rolled up on by the cops. That's perfect. <laughs> Feels like uh, feels like old times. No, just normal business here, guys. <laughs> Everything is cool. We are wearing psychedelics outfits. So let's talk about like maybe the structure of yeah. the. So you've got a big ibogaine manufacturer, which I found amazing. Thank you. You've got Project Eros. Is that what it's called? Oh, the Desire Project. Desire, there, it's close. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. And yeah. then the tech pro program. Right. Yeah. So we're basically set up with two divisions. We have tech and drug research. And the technology, of course, iStream, mm -hmm. it's going well. And I'm super proud of mm -hmm. what the team has done. A little bit of visionary mixed with a little bit of what's already happening. I always joke, like, Steve Jobs did not invent the iPhone. He just took a bunch of stuff that was already laying around right. and kind of figured it out, right? And not dissimilar. I mean, AI is lying around. Psychedelics are coming up. All these component pieces. And it's just about how do you take what is there and innovate in a way that you're just on time, maybe a little bit ahead of it. A little bit like mm -hmm. the old Gretzky analogy, like be where the puck is going. Ah, uh, uh yeah. -huh. And then, yeah, and then on the drug research side, I began to me, I mean, everybody talks about psilocybin, which is cool because we're familiar with it. But I began, I think, is a dark horse. Totally. It's going to be amazing what can happen with Ibogaine. I agree. What already is happening. Yeah. And even in the few years I've been tracking it, the safety profile of Ibogaine has improved incredibly. Yeah. Even in the underground. And I can't wait to see what happens in the above ground to make it even safer. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's kind of this misnomer about Ibogaine is it's going to kill everyone. It's so <laughs> unsafe. You know, yeah. and, and that benefits some people who want to talk mm -hmm. about it being unsafe. But when you actually look at the mathematics and you look at the people who've gone through, if they're screened appropriately mm -hmm. and dosed appropriately, it's a tremendously safe drug. It's just that we're so accustomed to all the psychedelics kind of being like, take an infinite volume and you'll be fine. With Ibogaine, it, it, it is a different story, but like anything, take too much aspirin. You, you're not yeah. going to be okay. Or water. <laughs> right? Yeah, water. Yeah. So I think, and again, when we think about like risk benefit, like what is the promise of Ibogaine? Mm -hmm. Opiate addiction is such a tremendous challenge. And then, not to geek out, but the BDNF and GDNF profile is astounding, that neuro growth. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be applied across a lot of other indications as well. I am I mean, my bet is we hear Ibogaine talked about a lot more in 2022. Yeah, wholeheartedly. Yeah. I remember ages ago, there were like sneaky references in some Hollywood situations. Right. Like uh, Homeland. <laughs> I'm never going to forget those episodes. I'm like, that's <laughs> horrifying. But yes. <laughs> it's probably how it would have gone. Well, and I think the other thing people don't realize about Ibogaine is the experience of it's totally different. Mm -hmm. So if like... Yeah, if it's a, not a classic tryptamine or... It's not. So if, if, if like a listener was curious about it, you could go and... Actually, Hamilton Morris does an amazing episode on mm. Hamilton's pharmacopoeia about Ibogaine. I still haven't seen that. Oh my That's gosh. Ridiculous. Man, you got to tune in. It's like Hamilton is the boss. I, I, I just I got to record him. with him in Philly recently. Cool. But uh, yeah, he was... Not impressed that I missed some of his episodes before. That's fair. He's a different <laughs> cat. But I appreciate that yeah, about him. Totally. He's like, I always love the open skeptic. That's yeah, Hamilton. Absolutely. He's like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm listening, but I'm tremendously critical. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he thinks I begin is a smasher beyond what we already see in practice and the, and mm -hmm. the real world evidence. Anyway, I, I'm a fan and it's a dreamlike state. 
So it's a very different experience for people. And I, th- I, th- I just, I believe wholeheartedly. It shows a lot of promise. But let's yeah. get it in the lab, right? That's the idea. We need a lot of data. We need a lot of data and we need the synthetic. So that's yeah. where we started. We're like, the FDA is not going to approve a semi. Yeah, how would they? They're just not. So yeah. that was our angle early again. And now we're going to be first to market with a full synthetic. And that's going to mm-hmm. let us do our own research and support other people and be a big drug supplier. So it's mainly a manufactured thing, but you're providing to other groups so they can research and see if they can get it through for different indications, right? Precisely. And, then, and yourself, you, are you also trying to do that at MindCure? Yeah, so we cool. have we have a program that we, again, kind of quietly announced just this past mm-hmm. week that we're oh, advancing. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, I think it's 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 early days and, mm-hmm. a, and anybody who's paying attention could telegraph. Of course, that's what I would do. Yeah. You know, I've got the Ibogaine, so why wouldn't I do a bit of research? Mm-hmm. And I also feel like as an industry, the more we can work together, if other people have ideas about indications they'd like to pursue, then Mm -hmm. I'll happily supply them with the drug. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the Desire Project. Love it. Let's do it. Yeah. We emailed all our folks about it and we got a lot of people interested to learn more. Who doesn't like talking about (laughs) sex? It's a... It's a topic we adore. Right. So is it, a, what drug are we looking at and what indication? Okay. So we're looking at MDMA and we're looking at MDMA within a psychotherapeutic kind of container. And, and the indication specifically is HSDD, which is hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And a lot of people hear hypo and think too much, but it's actually too little. And what that means is women who lack an ability to feel sexual desire. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, just for the listener, paint a short landscape about sex and the the stages of, and we all think we already Mm -hmm. know it, but it does break down into something that we don't think about all the time. So orgasm is the end. That's the finale, the fireworks show, and we we talk a lot about that. Mm -hmm. Prior to this idea of orgasm or resolution, we have arousal. Prior to arousal, we have desire. So what we're talking about with the Desire Project is not about dosing people to go and have sex. It's a different, you know, paradigm. Not that I'm disinterested in that, but I, I know that in order to get to the end, you have to start at the beginning. And there's a huge population of women who can't even kind of get their motor running, for lack of a better term. And that's where we focus on desire. And we know as well that desire for women starts squarely between the ears, it's a, this is mm-hmm. a mental thing. And the things that are on the market are doing the like physical piece. They're not addressing the root. And the market's huge and it's growing really fast. Mm-hmm. 14% of women are diagnosed right now. Oh, wow. 40% of women have a complaint premenopausal about it. Mm-hmm. And the segment's growing at about 26% a year, year over year. Yeah. It's not a small number. So nine wow. and a half million potential patients this is about half the size of PTSD. Right. On mass, which is still really big, and with its growth rate, it will it will meet it pretty right. quick. I remember reading a uh, interesting book critiquing psychiatry recently called Saving Normal. Okay, and there was like a section in there about overdiagnosing sexual problems, but he was like glossing over it in a, such a weird kind of gross way. Yeah, saying oh people don't need to be sexual, we shouldn't have drugs there. It's like what? that's fucking crazy. Like what? Are you talking about, dude? Is it um, tro- it's that like- was probably my biggest critique on that book, Saving Normal, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I'm like, uh, okay, but I don't think you get it, but okay. <laughs> well, sexuality is a primal part of our being human mm-hmm. beings. And we know, like any, any adult knows, when they've had a, a period of good sexual intimate interaction with either themselves or another person, you just generally have a better mental outlook. Like mm-hmm. you just feel better about yourself in the world. This is a fact. Mm-hmm. And it's not because we're all sex driven. It's that that is a part of being human. Mm-hmm. Mental health and sexual health are intimately tied together. Yeah. And for women, a lot of this population, it's just, it's just kind of a little bit about the thousand cuts of being a woman as mm-hmm. you age. And as well, a lot of it, for a segment of uh, the the diagnosed is body image issues, self image issues, our ability to not just show up fully and wholly. Right. And it's hard to do that. That's right. If, I saw some right? mainstream articles discussing that, like with very similar language there recently. Yeah. So how do you expect to get to orgasm if you can't even really show up and be mm-hmm. present? Mm-hmm. And what's been astounding. So you mentioned, like you shared the 
the project when we announced it, mm -hmm. the number of emails from people who are talking about not just the lack of sexual desire, but the but what it does. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, I lost my marriage to it. Right. I've, I've entered like a period of depression because I feel like you know everyone's expectation is to yeah. be in relationship. Like I'm alone. Plenty of secondary tertiary results. Oh my gosh, yeah. and it's, it's sad. You know, uh, and I think part of it too is the fellas I talk to. Nobody wants to think that anybody they were ever with suffered from right. that. But then there's also this idea of like when Harry Met Sally came out and the orgasm scene was mm -hmm. a smash hit because it's true. Right. There is a component part of female sexuality that is you just kind of show up. And, and that's not right. No guy wants to be in that position. No woman does. And anything that wants someone or, or that has someone wanting to want it more to me feels like a you know, reasonable, investable outcome. Agreed. <laughs> so is it, it sounds like we're, we're kind of taking a psychotherapy track similar to the PTSD work MAPS is doing. So mm. we're, what are the underlying causes there? Seeing if we can help them progress through it through drug assisted protocol, right? Yeah, this is exactly it. And I'm not sure that MDMA is the only way, but I do know when you think about the next molecule to market, of course, yeah. you know, as a capitalist paradigm. It helps being, a lot to know that one's made a lot of progress. That one's made a lot of progress yeah. and we can bet on it. And we have a high degree of confidence and not just me, but our research team, which is really, you know, they're the people who are going to do the work. Yeah. We've got the two most well-cited researchers in female sexual desire. Mm. One of them actually designed the diagnostic, which oh, is amazing. amazing. Yeah. And then Jennifer Mitchell, who was a principal investigator on the MAPS phase three trial. That's so great. MDMA specialist, sex specialist, and they're really bullish on the program. So it's just about getting it into, getting into phase two studies. And right. that's where we're heading. So now iStream. Yes. What do we have going on with iStream? This is probably the biggest mystery for me. Uh-huh. Well, so we, we have the product is done. It's in MVP. It's in a closed beta at the moment. We're across nine states and three provinces. In clinics? In clinics. Cool. Iterating on the program. And the plan is to be commercial Q1, Q2. So the idea is also not to stamp out any uh, psychedelic-only future. But the psychedelic market is relative to the total psychiatric psychotherapy market. Pretty Minuscule. small. Minuscule. So iStream is designed to be drug agnostic. So we can do psychedelics and we've built a lot of amazing tools One of for our it. rallying cries, actually. Is it really? <laughs> we're wildly drug agnostic. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because we have to be if we're actually thinking about advancing mental health, uh, which we are. And so we'll start in psychedelics and expand beyond rapidly. But I think the kind of... The, the sleeper, the, the secret sauce, if you will, is the protocol catalog. So this idea that a therapist can unlock a variety of protocols in there for different patients and get personalized care at that level, as well as it lets all of us who are developing protocols and drugs get a new revenue line, right? When we're like the Netflix of, we, we have the content and we distribute it. And so that allows us to pick up value at every segment of the value chain and create right. an amazing product that can unify mm -hmm. mental health care globally. I mean, that's a big statement, but there's no reason we can't. So it's like kind of a user platform. So the patient would use it. The It's a back end for the whole practice, that's like right. an EHR 100%. as well. That's pretty cool. It's not bad. No, like the fact that it's integrated, you know, allows for a lot of learning, like you say. There's there's a lot underneath what you said. Yeah, there <laughs> and, is a lot um, underneath. Like it. there's it's so cool because we need this big data approach to know where we're going. Totally. A lot of people critique it, but it's like you know, how we're doing medicine right now is poorly informed. Well, often and leaves a lot desired. It does. And if we think about our path to trauma, our path to pain, our path to hurt, our path mm. to whatever, it was unique. And so I can't imagine a one fits all approach to how we heal. Mm -hmm. And so I think like personalization, having the data, allowing people to really see how they're trending, as well as to allow that to inform further drug research. When, right. when I know that this segment of the population performs this way through this protocol, mm -hmm. we can let those developers know and say, hey, you might adapt your protocol to look like this and get better outcomes. Maybe right. you'll unlock more insurance payment. Maybe you're going to sell more mm -hmm. drugs, help more people. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it can be a fundamental tool to expand the whole industry. 
Right, essential, really. It's like, I mean, are we going to ignore computers? Yeah. Like, we probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> we could go back to the... Yeah. yeah. No, like, that's not the future yeah. of healthcare. Right, I spent long enough time in software to understand, like, a lot of these implications. I get some of the concerns. I'm also just like, this is how we're going to do better personalized care. I agree. Yeah. And and I think it's it's table stakes to make a Vegas joke while we're in Vegas. <laughs> it's table stakes to allow people to control their data. So if mm -hmm. at any time someone wants their data gone, it's gone. That's that's awesome. I mean, nice. that's the basics of it. Yeah. Because I feel that way. So right. why shouldn't everyone have the same opportunity that I feel like this is my most personal information? Yeah. But there's also this idea of fascinating to me was when we did a bunch of market research, the number of people who said... I, I want to submit my data because it feels a bit like like me helping someone else go through their like it's I'm doing the work so someone an organ else transplant can, or donation totally. right and I never really I mean I wish I could say I thought of all the things but I didn't this mm -hmm. idea of like that being the goodwill and the contribution back to the system for a lot of people it's kind of like being a sponsor in AA. Right. It's your way of helping someone else do the hard work that collectively mm -hmm. you can move farther faster when you get it. Yeah. And that feels really good. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Cool. So we're here in Vegas for all yes. these conferences. Yo. <laughs> we're just about to hit a big run of Vegas a lot of Miami. FaceTime. And yes. it's kind of crazy. But yeah, this is, looks like it's going to be a really fun event here. Meet Delic at Area, Area 15. Yes. Meow Wolf. Yeah, my, my grandfather was at Area 51. No kidding. <laughs> what? not Area 15 because it's okay. brand new. Yeah, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, that's an after-party combo. <laughs> after-party combo. So, yeah, this is going to be really fun. There's even, like, after-parties built in. We don't have to go to another location. That feels good. Have you been to a Meow Wolf yet? I have not. It's outstanding. Is it? Here, yeah. I went to the uh, Santa Fe, the original one in New Mexico. Oh, cool. Gorgeous. And... Immersive as hell. I'm excited. I mean, I think all of this, those of us in the industry, most of us, I would say, not all, mm. actually. There's a fair number of people who have no previous psychedelic experience. Yes. That's a conversation <laughs> also. But I think the idea of, of being open to the full sensory experience, as well as being open to, like, coming back to reality of talking to people and seeing, like, I'm so excited to meet, like, to jam with you. Now we're meeting in real life person. There's a whole new element that you get a sense exactly. of, right? Yeah. And I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things come, like, once we all have a breather after this, because we're going to all be running That's pretty That's a really hard. good point. Yes. It's going to be a lot now of action. Connected. It's going to be a lot of yeah. action, I think, coming out. Like, that's my mm -hmm. crystal ball prediction. If <laughs> anybody cares to hear my two cents, it's looking someone in the eye, business moves at the speed of trust. There's just no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think this is a catalyst for the industry and for us all to advance. I, I just think it's a perfect place, a perfect space, a perfect mix of all the, all the pieces, little yeah. sleep. That's the only thing that might be lacking. <laughs> yeah. If I wasn't such a crybaby, this would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. Anything else that we might have missed that people might want in this particular segment? Oh, geez. I mean, Are you I on would the CSE? Say, what's that? Are CSE? we on the CSE? Yeah, we're on the CSE, the OTCQX. Um, so we're trading in the States as well. I mean, I would say if you, you know, if you think about MindCure, I would say just pay attention. We deliver on our promises. We have a pretty interesting catalyst coming up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and again, we're... we're we're kind of a humble, committed organization and that at the same time with big plans. And mm -hmm. so you're not going to see a lot of us promising things we're not going to deliver, but you will see things that maybe people won't expect. So awesome. No big celebrity endorsements coming. I don't tell any secrets, man. <laughs> you awesome. know the game. I can't tell you what's uh, that coming. Was a, that was a dig on uh, Deepak Chopra. But, <laughs> but here's a piece, and, and this is actually probably worth mentioning. I think... Like data is going to move the science. We know that. And that's what we're all working on. But s story is going to move the culture. Mm -hmm. And so there is, some, I was on a panel the other day and someone was smacking down one of the people who's enrolled a celebrity, mm -hmm. you know, a spokesperson. But it, it, for a segment of the population, like we're still in an echo chamber. We're still in our small world of like people Celebrities do. Celebrities can move the needle. They can. Yeah. If it's the right person with the right message at the right time for the right audience and I, I think again we're, we're early adopters 
we're at the beginning of the curve and if the right people can put their hand up and say, I did this, it helped me, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And that makes someone explore it and right. make their own opinions. Amazing. That there was someone like that for me. If you boil it down to the essentials, that's a different. Yeah, you that's know. A really different and if track. we can decouple the celebrity piece and just mm -hmm. be like, that's someone that someone else trusts for whatever given reason. Yeah. Yeah. Amy's mom, <laughs> right? <laughs> like changed her life. So yeah. it's okay, but I get there's a little twinge of of maybe it's counter psychedelia to be mainstream, blah blah blah. But I, I actually I'm I'm kind of I am society agnostic in how we get this out to everyone provided mm -hmm. that people hear about the real science and the real outcomes. If it's Lamar Odom who shares it or Mike Tyson or Deepak, mm -hmm. whoever, great. Right. If they touch the, the person who needs to hear about it, all right, that's great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, I think that's good for now. Yeah. So let's do it again though, it's super fun. I think there's a lot more our listeners really want to hear from you about. So. Well, thank you, sir. I uh, I enjoyed it. It's so great to meet you in real life. And I am I have to say, I'm really glad that plan A didn't work out and we're not in a dark <laughs> room somewhere in a business center and we're standing on, like... Yeah, we the, barely got hassled. We barely got hassled. It And it I kind of, you know, it was nice to have the police give us a little <laughs> moment of sunshine. And, what yeah. are you guys doing here? Jumpstart the coffee. It's good. This is a, seems like the right way to start Vegas. <laughs> Just a cop visit early on. Get it out of the way. very unique and might not happen again. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, yeah, good. this is fascinating. It's great. Cool. All right. Well, Thanks, thank you. Man. Yeah, we'll do it again next time. Okay. <laughs>